China is the largest foreign holder of U.S. Treasury securities. We know that. But the country has been rethinking that position, especially after the recent U.S. government shutdown. For more on this, I'm joined by Stephen Roach, live for us in Beijing. He's a senior fellow at Yale University, Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. Stephen, good to see you there. Hope you are well. You recently wrote an article regarding the debt problem. Walk us through what you were thinking when you talked about what China should do about the U.S. debt problem in terms of Treasury bills. Well, Phil, China has a huge overweight in treasuries and uh, other dollar-based assets, <clears throat> such as agency debt held in Fannie uh, Mae and Freddie Mac securities. Uh, add them all up, it's about two trillion uh, U.S. dollars, maybe 15 percent of uh, total uh, debt outstanding to, to the public. Um, China's made that bet in large part uh, to limit the appreciation of the RMB, uh, which keeps its exports <coughs> competitive in global markets. But we know that the export model is now in the process of changing uh, to one that draws greater support from internal private consumption. So China doesn't need to make that uh, overweight bet uh, in, in dollars. And let's face it, the, uh, the treasuries are damaged merchandise in the aftermath of this um, shut down and near default on the debt. So I think this is a wake up call for China to uh, really accelerate its shift to a different growth strategy, one that does not rely on betting excessively on U.S. debt. S Stephen, in your article, you talk about the codependency co between the United States and China. Yes, they buy our debt. In turn, we go out and buy things at Walmart. Uh, I, I think we understand that part of it. W one thing that I have a question on is, let's say they buy less U.S. debt, which they are slowly doing. What's the impact to the United States? Well, the impact to the U.S. is, um, you know, unless we control our budget deficits and start saving more, then uh, lacking in the, the buying of our major uh, foreign lender, our interest rates will go up. That will impede uh, the economy. The dollar could go down, uh, and that would that would those would both cause pressures on um, uh, the, the U.S. economy. Do, do you think the, this issue about the renminbi not being strong enough versus the U.S. dollar has been a, a very hot button for the last few years in America and in China? And it's calmed down a lot. Do you think we're reaching some sort of fair value here between that currency? Well, I think it's been a hot button because um, we have a growth problem in the U.S. We have high structural unemployment. And the politicians, of course, in Washington don't want to admit that um, any of this is their fault. They want to blame someone else, and that's usually China. But you're right. The, the RMB is up now 35 percent versus the dollar uh, relative to levels prevailing in July of 2005. So the idea that China is manipulating an undervalued currency is drawn into question by fact. More recently in the news, uh, specifically there in China, short-term interest rates have spiked up. Some say it's because the government's tightening up some of the lending that's happening in the, uh, in the different cities in China, this jump in short-term rates. What are you hearing there on the ground, and what's the impact of this going to be overall on the economy? Well, it's the second time in uh, four months where we've seen a, a, a spike in the overnight lending rate. Um, People's Bank of China has come in to uh, inject liquidity, so it's not uh, a sustainable uh, uh, a credit crunch in any way whatsoever. But it does suggest that the authorities uh, are sending a signal to uh, the banking sector and to borrowers that the days of leveraged, uh, open-ended borrowing to fund economic growth in China are nearing an end. The government wants to wean China from this debt-intensive growth dynamic, which has certainly been a problematic uh, issue in other countries around the world, including, of course, the United States. But, but, but my follow-up question to that is, by liberalizing lending rates, essentially saying, look, each individual bank can charge whatever they feel is appropriate to lend money to any individual or company, but explain to our viewers why that is a good thing. Well, I think... Uh, a big agenda item on the reform front for China is uh, the liberalization of both 
lending rates, which they've done to, to move to more of a market-based allocation uh, of, uh, uh, of lending uh, to businesses and state owned enterprises. But now the other, they need to drop the other shoe, which is the liberalization of deposit rates. And uh, I don't know if they're going to do that at the upcoming policy meeting in November. I hope they do. Uh, but um, uh, moving to a more market-based uh, determination of uh, interest rates uh, will avoid the dislocations that come from uh, this administered system, which can uh, create problems with credit allocation, capital allocation from time to time. All right. Stephen Roach, Yale University. Safe travels there in Asia, joining us live from Thank Beijing. You, Thank you.